Hey folks, All right. today we're going to be checking out chapter 12, uh, the primary assessment. Um, this is where our um, first interactions uh, with the patient uh, come into play. And this is where we really start getting into the detective work and figuring out what's wrong with the patient um, and uh, what steps we can take um, to help them with their either medical or traumatic issues. We could also be doing some interventions here in our primary assessment if we find any things like life threats. So let's jump right into it here. Um, uh, so what exactly is a primary assessment? Well, it's a, uh, it's a systematic way to look for life threats. Um, it's, uh, it's an easy way um, to remember uh, what to do uh, when we're first focusing on a patient and we're gonna learn our ABCs here. Um, we're gonna focus on life threats to the ABCs, which is airway, breathing, and circulation. Uh, so those are three main things that we're going to uh, be looking at there. Um, now, when it comes to air, airway, breathing, and circulation, the ABCs, uh, one of the first things that we gotta know is that we do not have to do it in that order, A, B, and then C. Um, it can vary and it depends on, as, as you see here, the patient's condition, um, how many EMTs are on the scene, other priorities you may determine um, as you, you're assessing the patient. Uh, so like for example, if uh, in CPR, we uh, learned the CAB uh, method there when we, uh, somebody is down on the ground, we check circulation first, right? We check their pulse uh, there and then we do airway Right. Or well, with the circulation, we check their pulse. They don't have one. Then we start the compressions. Then we open their airway, A, and then we give them breath, B. So we do the CAB for CPR. So you'll have to think through uh, and kind of quickly when you find your patient, which method are you going to use to assess the patient? Is it ABC? Is it CAB? Um, and so on. <clears throat> So as we said, the sequence uh, will vary. Um, if the patient's got signs of life, um, then ABC uh, it, uh, works most of the time. If there's no signs of life, then we'll do CAB, as we just talked about there. Um, and if we do find life threats here, we'll talk about what we're looking for, then the interventions to fix those are gonna happen right when we find them. Um, so they may be necessary. And obviously not every patient is gonna need an intervention. <clears throat> All right, so uh, some decision making here. Um, you know, if uh, if there's any vomit in the airway, we got to get that out very quickly. So um, if, if you notice that right away, then then you're going to be starting with a. Uh, getting it into the lungs, as we've talked about, is very serious and, and can be fatal. Uh, if we find any ble bleeding, exsanguinating bleeding, that means the patient is bleeding out. They're going to die because of the bleeding. Um, then we have to stop that immediately. Um, and then, uh, you know, we know this, breathing and circulation are critical for life. Um, so if we have a major problem with one, we better fix it quickly um, or else our, our patient could end up for the worst. You have a, one of the worst patient outcomes there or the worst patient outcome. So when we're doing our primary assessment, we're gonna figure out as we go through things like our general impression and doing our ABCs uh, there, whether or not um, we need to act with urgency or if we have time to, to stay and play a little bit as the saying goes, um, do we, can we stay at the house and take the patient's vital signs and move them normally at a nice uh, at an easy pace onto the cotton to the ambulance or do we walk in the door and this person looks like death and we need to get them out and into the ambulance as soon as possible and then do the vast majority of our assessments and interventions on the way to the hospital um, so we're going to be able to de determine that urgency uh, needed whether it's very ur urgent or if we're moving at a, a just a normal pace. <clears throat> All right, so uh, 
in learning our primary assessment, it's going to help if we're looking at our medical assessment sheets uh, that we handed out there. Um, it lists all the things in that uh, sheet, uh, the steps that we're going to be taking. Um, as you can see in that sheet, uh, if you look at it, the first thing that we're going to do is form a general impression. Uh, after that, we're going to assess the patient's mental status. Like, are they with it? Are they not with it? Are they responsive? Are they unresponsive? We're gonna assess the airway to see if it's open. We're gonna assess their breathing to see if it's adequate. And we're gonna assess their circulation to see if that's adequate or if there's problems like major bleeding. We're also gonna determine then after going through all of that, uh, those assessments there and our general impression, um, we're going to uh, determine a patient priority. Do we need to take them lights and sirens to the hospital or can, like we said, can we take the time in the house to do our assessments, maybe even treatments before we move them to the ambulance and then get on the road to the hospital. <clears throat> so let's talk about forming a general impression. Um, in forming a general impression, we have to take in a lot of things uh, into account. So the environment that the, pa the patient is in, uh, their chief complaints and their appearance, um, a lot kind of goes into it. And, um, Forming your impression will help to determine the urgency with which you need to move. Um, if you walk into a place and everything looks great, then you may uh, be okay. But if you, again, if you walk in and the patient looks really sick um, or they're tripoding and breathing heavily and uh, noisily and they're pale, well then you're gonna have to move a little bit more urgently. Or urgently their problem is uh, obviously a little bit more uh, severe. Um, it helps to set your priorities uh, there as well. We'll talk about it. So the general impression um, is basically uh, when you walk into a room and you first see the patient. Now we've all walked into a room at some point and seen a family member or a friend or, or somebody that we know or uh, and you look at them and you're like, wow, you are sick. Well, you know, they just really look ill. You, they don't have to say anything at all. You can just tell that they're, they're sick. Well, that right there is a general impression. You immediately took in all this information, whether you realized it or not, you processed like how their skin is looking, if they look tired, their positioning, um, you know, things in their environment maybe. And you put that together in your brain and said, okay, they're sick. So uh, we do this anyways. Uh, uh, when we see people like this, um, but now we really have to pay attention to why do I feel like this person looks sick um, uh, and the reasons behind it. So we're going to give them the look test. It's feeling from the environment um, as, as well as like we said, looking at your, your patient there. Um, and uh, like I said, it's your first, it's your gut instinct, it's your gut impression uh, that you get of the patient uh, when you start, when you first encounter them. So let's look at this little girl here for a second. Um, what would your general impression be of her? So first time you're seeing her, um, what are we seeing here with this girl? Does she look um, healthy? Does she have any injuries? Is there anything worrisome about those injuries? Uh, what does her skin condition look like? Um, is she pale? Um, does she look... Um, warm, a healthy looking skin color and dry, is she profusely sweating, is she crying, uh, things like that. So let's take a look at it. It looks like she's holding a, a handkerchief or something like that on her knee. She's clearly uh, skating uh, to the spill probably here on this sidewalk. It looks like a significant amount of blood uh, in there, so she's bleeding pretty good. I don't see any puddles of blood underneath her though, so, so that's good. We also see a scrape on her head and she's not wearing a helmet and there's nothing right around her. So the environment and the look, uh, looking at the patient tells me she probably wasn't wearing a helmet. So maybe we're dealing with a head injury here. When we talk about kids, one thing that you'll will learn is that quiet kids aren't, uh, aren't the patients that you really want. That can be kind of scary. If a kid hits their head on the sidewalk, gets themselves cut like that, they're probably gonna be crying right? I'm probably going to be crying. So maybe this mental status here that we're seeing is indicative of a head injury. Uh, maybe she has an altered mental status here. 
Um, I can't tell, you know, it's a picture. Is she leaning over? Is she slumped kind of over like that? Is she just changing position while this picture was taken? Um, is she holding her cheek there because of another injury? All these things in here. So, um, and uh, you got to learn that it's okay if your general impression tells you that, well, it, that things might be worse than, than they actually are. It's all right to assume that from your general impression to think that things are worse. You don't want to think things are okay and then come to find out that they're not. Usually assuming the worst for your patient in that moment um, can be a good way to go. And then as we assess the patient, as we figure out what's going on, we can kind of back off of the urgency that our general impression uh, uh, gives to us there. <clears throat> so, uh, one of the things about the general impression that works for us is it helps to us uh, helps us to identify patients that are critical right off the bat. Um, sometimes it's easy to to see this. Maybe they're just lifeless, right? They're just laying on the ground, not moving, not responsive. Um, maybe it's somebody who's laying in a big pool of blood. Um, and they look really pale and they're sweaty, uh, things like that. Um, Maybe it'll help us uh, also to identify patients that are less critical. Maybe it's the stubbed toe guy that answers his door uh, without any pain, walks around without any pain. And, you know, okay, we can figure out that that guy's not as critical as, as somebody else who maybe appeared lifeless or bleeding. Um, as soon as we figure out if somebody is lifeless, obviously, we will initiate CPR and get the AED going as soon as possible. Um, we can uh, kind of figure out a lot of times uh, if somebody has an altered mental status just by observing them uh, a little bit with that first few seconds of forming their general impression. They may have an obvious um, uh, altered mental status uh, there. So that's important to pay attention for. Um, we can look at a patient if they're unusually anxious, if they're scared, if they're uh, sweaty, profusely sweaty, uh, diaphoretic, uh, if they're pale. If they're confused along with those things, that could be an indication that they're in shock. So uh, those things will help identify priority patients for us. Um, other patients that could be critical, we have trauma to the head, the chest, the abdomen, or the pelvis. Uh, those are all critical areas and we don't want those to be injured. There's lots of uh, you know, uh, critical organs and blood vessels and, and et cetera in those parts, right? So uh, obvious trauma to those places, right? A stabbing, a gunshot wound, um, a, you know, a blunt uh, injury, blunt force trauma injury over there. Um, and the position of the patient uh, can help uh, indicate things for us too. So if they're tripoding, right? We know that is a specific position. Um, somebody that is uh, having trouble breathing will take. You're not gonna see that in any other patient. So that, that tells you there's respiratory distress happening at the, at the least. Um, you know, that shows you difficult breathing. There's also Levin's sign. And this is when a patient's having chest pain and they're just grabbing their chest. They're like, ah, oh, you know, having a heart attack, chest pain, whatever it might be. When they're grabbing their chest like that, that's called Levin's sign. And it should be a really obvious sign, like tripoding, that somebody is having a medical issue here. It gives us an idea of what's happening, right? Tripod. We know it's, it's difficulty breathing. Levin's sign, we're gonna know that it's chest discomfort. It's most likely a cardiac um, issue there. <clears throat> so taking in their, um, their uh, positioning also helps. Uh, so now after the general impression, we're gonna figure out what the patient's chief complaint is. Uh, this is the reason that they called uh, EMS, right? Uh, why are, are we here basically is, is the question that we're, um, uh, asking them or answering there. Um, it could be specific, uh, you know, my stomach really hurts or um, I broke my arm, something like that. Or it could be uh, vague, like I'm just not feeling good. And, you know, that obviously is a little bit harder and we have to do a little bit more detective work. And we may not be able to figure anything out if the patient can't figure it out, but, but that's okay. Um, we'll figure that out uh, in our assessments. Um, Let's go back here for a second on the, on the chief complaint. Um, this is when we, when we get this, all right, if we're looking at our skills sheet and we see down there, this is basically the, when we form the general impression, it's us walking into the room, okay? And this is right before we've seen our patient. 
When we get to the chief complaint here, this is where we're gonna make our first contact with the patient. And uh, what you wanna do is you wanna introduce yourself to the patient. So for example, I'd say, hi, my name's Joe. I'm from the rescue squad. Uh, can you tell me what's going on today? Um, it's nice to ask a good open-ended question, uh, you know, uh, to get them to, to get speaking. Uh, obviously, let's be professional. Let's introduce ourselves. Um, if the patient's sitting down in a chair or, or on a couch or something like that, then kneel down in front of them. Why don't you get down on one knee, kind of get on the same level. You don't want to be looking down on somebody uh, there. It helps that, that kind of... Um, uh, body language, that nonverbal communication um, can um, help them or uh, make it more difficult for them to trust us. So if you get on the same level when you're talking to them, when you introduce yourself, that can help build the trust there with your patient. So when we get the chief complaint, again, it's as simple as saying, hi, my name is so-and-so. Uh, you know, Hi, my name is Joe I'm from the rescue squad. Can you tell me what's going on today? All right, so nice open-ended question. Get them to answer that. And that's what your chief complaint is going to be. So let's say you ask somebody that and like, oh, I'm having a really tough time breathing, right? Chief complaint is they're having a tough time breathing. Um, hey, what's going on? Can you tell me what's going on today? Like, ah, I fell and broke my arm. Oh, their chief complaint is that they broke their arm. It's pretty simple. It's their biggest complaint. It's their biggest complaint. And all we usually got to do is ask them. Now, if they're not conscious, we may have to be able to ask a bystander or somebody else like that. Now, when we're forming an impression of the of the patient and we're doing uh, we're going through this, we're going to be looking at the patient to determine their age, their sex, their positioning. Um, we're going to be listening for breathing sound, any kind of sounds that may give us clues as to what's going on. So, uh, if they're unconscious and moaning, if they're snoring, wheezing, or gurgling, uh, you know, different respiratory sounds there, and then we can smell for hazardous fumes urine, feces, vomitus, or even decaying flesh. Um, uh, so we're going to be using our senses, obviously, uh, all of our senses. And, and we have to pay attention to these things. Um, you know, it's not often we look at somebody and then we kind of run down their statistics. Like, okay, this lady is approximately 70. She's a lady. Um, and she's sitting in a tripod position. Like, so we don't see somebody and start registering those things. And so we start, have, we start having to... Uh, consciously recognize um, our patients, you know, age, sex, position, the condition of their skin, how their breathing sounds. Like you never pay attention to somebody's breathing, but now every patient that we have, uh, we have to pay attention. Does it making sounds? What's the work of breathing like? Um, all those kind of things. And even the smells. Uh, again, we got to pay attention to, to the smells there. So we're really using our senses. So look, listen, smell. We'll, we'll be touching our patients later. Um, it is always advised though, never to taste your patient. That's always, uh, uh, that's, that's out. Can't do that, can't do that. So look, listen and smell and obviously later we'll, we'll palpate our patient and, and, uh, and touch them later. All right, so, so far we have our general impression and figuring out our patient's chief complaint as we're moving down our skills sheet. The next we get to our mental status. We have to assess the patient's mental status. <clears throat> and we do that using the um, acronym AVPU uh, there. That stands for um, whether or not the patient is alert. Um, what alert means is that they're conscious, um, and they're awake, uh, they can talk to you. Um, now, they may be confused uh, and things like that. But what we want, want really to kind of figure out um, if things are all okay mentally, is we're gonna ask a couple of questions. There's uh, three here that we can ask, like, do you know who you are? Do you know where you are? Do you know what time it is? You know, what day it is, that kind of thing. And sometimes with trauma, we can ask, do you know what happened? Like, what happened here? Uh, what were the events leading up to this? Um, you know, you should hopefully be able to remember what has happened to you. So this is a person that is going to respond to you, okay? Uh, they are what's called alert and oriented times three. It's person, place, and time, okay? Alert and oriented times three or AO times three or AO times three. 
So that's being alert. Now you can be alert, but disoriented, right? Maybe you come into the diabetic, uh, diabetic's house and they're alert, they'll answer your questions, they'll look at you, the, the nonverbal communication may be on point, but they're confused about what's going on. They're not sure what day it is. They're not feeling so well, but you know, you can tell they're off a little bit there if there's confusion. So they may be alert, but disoriented also. So you can be alert and oriented times three, times two, times one, whatever it might be, person, place, and time. Um, but you can be, uh, again, alert and disoriented as well. Um, so when we come up to our patients, if they're talking to you and things like that, they're alert. They're alert. Now, the rest of this, VP and U, all of these patients, if they fall into any of these, any of the following categories, they are unconscious. Okay. Alert is the only category where they will be conscious. Okay. VP and U, they are all unconscious. So what we're going to talk about here is when somebody is unconscious, there's actually different levels of it. I may be able to go to a, a unconscious patient and you know yell at them like, hey, Johnny, you okay? Wake up, buddy. And, and they wake up. Or maybe they uh, flutter their eyes or maybe they moan or, or move or something like that and they can wake up. But maybe we yell at this guy and we're like, hey, Johnny, wake up. You all right, buddy? And nothing. We get no response whatsoever. Well, he's very, he's more unconscious than what a verbal stimulus would uh, um, uh, wake somebody up for, okay? Um, <clears throat> so that would be the next thing. So if somebody is unconscious, we'll try to, to wake them up. Like we'll yell at them a little bit. We'll raise our voices. We'll use our voices as a tool to see if these people, if we can wake them up, if we get any kind of response, a moan, a flutter of the eyes, uh, they reposition themselves, anything like that. If they do do one of those things, then they're, um, they're alert to verbal stimulus, right? So they're, they're alert to verbal stimulus. Um, if they don't, then we try to give them a painful response. Now, obviously we're here to take care of people. So when we inflict pain on people, we have to do it responsibly um, there. So, if, uh, so we're not just out here hurting people, uh, obviously. So if they're not, um, responsive to verbal stimulus, then we'll try pain. Um, one of the easy ways to do it is you can pinch the earlobe real hard. Um, you can do that. Um, the way I like to do it is I take my pen and I stick it between their knuckles like that, and I just squeeze the knuckles. You don't have to squeeze very hard, and that hurts. Um, go ahead and try it out if you if you've got one. Just put it right between your knuckles and squeeze. Right. That can hurt. Um, and it's not gonna cause any damage. It's not gonna you know, leave any marks or anything like that. There's also a pressure point right here on the back. If you've ever had that um, pressed in, then you know how painful that can be. And again, it's not a permanent pain. It doesn't leave any marks or anything. Right? You can try that as well. Um, there's something that a lot of people do, which is out, it should be on the way out. You shouldn't do it. It's called a sternal rub. They take their, uh, their knuckles and they rub their sternum vigorously up and down. Um, that really hurts and it can uh, lead to a lot of bruising and, and things like that on the chest. But if this is a trauma patient, you don't want to be doing that on their sternum, right? That's so I think it's irresponsible, frankly. Um, we, could be, uh, we could be hurting our patient more. We could be making the situation worse. So we can inflict pain in a responsible way that's not gonna hurt more uh, or, or worsen injuries um, or hurt a patient more, leave marks or all that kind of stuff. Um, so there's a few ways to do it. Now, if you inflict the pain and then, they, um, and then what we're looking for is any eye movement, fluttering, moaning, uh, repositioning, if they wake up a little bit, that kind of thing, then they're alert to painful response, okay? And then if they don't respond to it, then they're unresponsive. And this is going to be our deepest layer of unconsciousness, being unresponsive. So we have the unconscious people, the, the verbal people are the closest to, like, to waking up, even though they may not. The painful people are a little bit further away and deep, more deeper, uh, deeply unconscious, and then there's the completely unconscious and totally unresponsive folks 
um, at the bottom uh, there. So AVPU is alert uh, and oriented. Are they alert to ver a verbal response? Are they, uh, do they give us a response from a verbal stimuli? Do they give us a response from a painful stimuli? Or are they unresponsive? Um, in doing this, it's really easy. Um, generally, if, if a person, if you walk in and they're conscious, they're going to be alert to some level. Um, you know, if you ask, if you walk in and you ask somebody a question and they respond to you, they're going to be alert at some level. So this isn't difficult to do, but it is important. Um, it's also uh, important to remember that this can change. People can get worse, right? Maybe their oxygen saturation gets so low after you've gotten there and haven't had a chance to uh, give them oxygen yet that they, be, they go unconscious after you get there. Or maybe they were knocked unconscious by something and uh, by the time when you get there, they're unconscious, but by the time you're in the ambulance going to the hospital, they've come out of that uh, of being unconscious and uh, you know, they're now alert. So things can change, things can change, and it's fairly easy to, to figure this out and it doesn't take very long either. Um, the vast majority of the time, they're going to be alert and oriented. Um, and then there'll be some people that are alert but disoriented, and then you'll have your unconscious folks. All right. It doesn't take too long to figure this out. Um, so if you do have a high priority patient and you're trying to move with urgency uh, because your general impression was very poor, this doesn't take a long time uh, to figure out there. All right, so next we move on to the ABCs. Um, as we talked about, the order can vary uh, based on your findings. For example, if we get on scene and somebody is bleeding profusely, let's say a guy was um, using a chainsaw to cut, down, cut some logs in his backyard, cut some firewood, and that chainsaw jumped a bit and went into his leg and cut his femoral artery. And you get there and he's sitting in a, uh, a puddle of blood and his pants are just soaked with blood. Well, I'm not gonna sit there and uh, you know, figure out this guy's airway right away, um, or look at it, look at his breathing and assess his breathing. I'm going to go right into circulation and stop that bleeding uh, there. So again, the order can vary, right? And it depends on the situation. Normally, things go ABCs, but you don't have to stick with that. Um, now, when we're assessing these ABCs, we're looking for life threats. So. Uh, life threats in this situation is going to be anything that could kill your patient in the next several minutes, right? It might not be right now, but maybe in five minutes it kills them or 10 minutes, all right? Um, so uh, we're looking for those threats and we're looking to correct them um, as soon as we find them uh, as well. Um, we're looking for uh, information that could also help us later in our assessments um, here, and we'll talk about what that means uh, here in a moment. All right, so <clears throat> in this picture, they're going to be using the CAB um, uh, uh, method uh, there, if you will. So they'll check circulation, airway, and then breathing. So they're going to look for signs of life, um, if there's any movement. Um, this gentleman, uh, you know, they'd, they'd ask, uh, you know, hey, we're from the rescue squad. Can you tell us what's going on today? Obviously, he's not talking. He's not moving. He's not doing anything. So we can figure the chief complaint is, you know, he's in cardiac arrest or respiratory or whatever it may be. He's unresponsive. We can figure out his um, uh, mental status. He's clearly not alert. Uh, maybe we can wake him up with a yell or a little bit of pain. We'll check circulation for uh, pulses, uh, things like that. All right, um, let's look at our airway first. Uh, airways, uh, most of the time, your airway is going to be a pretty simple um, question uh, to ask. If they're alert and if they're talking to you, uh, you know, yelling, crying, whatever it may be, then their airway is fine. Their airway is going to be good, All right? Obviously, there could be um, you know, maybe somebody's yelling and they've, uh, or crying or something, and maybe they have a partial obstruction. But for the vast majority of the time, anybody that is going to be alert and talking to you or crying or yelling or whatever it may be, their airway is good. Right? We're looking for it to be patent. If you remember that vocab word, right? We want that nice open airway. Um, <clears throat> if it's not open or if it's going to close, 
we have to take measures to keep it open. Right? If it's not open, we'll use our airway maneuvers and our airway adjuncts uh, to open and keep it open uh, there. We may need extra medical help, for example, paramedics, so they can intubate to keep that airway open uh, there. But if there is a threat to it, then we have to fix it. Okay. If they're choking, we have to try to get that obstruction out. Um, if there's vomit or blood or fluids or foreign objects in the mouth, then we have to suction that out and, and get it out to make sure that our airway is uh, clear. Now, with the airway, there's two questions we're going to ask. This is important, so uh, let's make sure we know these questions. There are two questions we're going to ask about every patient. We're going to ask this to ourselves about our patient is, is their airway open and will it stay open? Is it open and will it stay open? Um, hopefully, and for the majority of the time, both of those questions are gonna be answered with a yes. Um, however, things can change. So maybe it's open now, but it's not going to be in 10 minutes. So let's say for example, your patient has a severe allergic reaction. They're allergic to bees, they're stung by a bee at a picnic and uh, they're having a severe allergic reaction. Well, maybe, their throat starts to swell. And so it's open when you get there, maybe their voice is a little bit raspy and changing because of some swelling, but maybe if we don't get like epi or something like that on board, then that uh, airway is going to swell closed um, over the next few minutes. So the airway is a constant consideration because it can change. Um, again, the vast majority of the time, it's gonna be fine. You're gonna have an alert and talking patients. However, if there's any danger uh, in the airway, then we have to be aware that this is a constant evaluation, that things can change, and we absolutely cannot be caught off guard by it. Um, that is uh, not acceptable, all right? We have to know or have an idea that this is going to either stay open or that we're gonna have some work to do coming up. We have to have a high index of suspicion. Uh, breathing. Um, so with breathing, what we're looking for is, um, uh, we know the two questions, right? We, we answered that last uh, chapter. Are they breathing and is it adequate? Now again, the vast majority of time, the answers to those questions is going to be yes. However, uh, sometimes at least one of those questions is gonna be a no. Um, so we need to figure that out and quickly. <clears throat> Um, so, and we may need to intervene uh, too. So if they're in respiratory arrest, obviously we're gonna provide um, PPV, some positive pressure ventilations with the bag valve mask for them. Uh, we may intervene if they're not alert, right? They have an altered mental status. Um, maybe they're unconscious and they're inadequately breathing. Maybe it's too slow. Maybe it's six times a minute. Maybe it's 30 times a minute, but it's just not adequate to get enough oxygen on board to perfuse the rest of the body. Maybe they have some level of alertness, maybe they're uh, disoriented, but they're also um, um, inadequately breathing. Um, maybe, this is, uh, maybe this is somebody that's having an anaphylactic reaction, right? They're hypoxic, so they're confused, their airway isn't cu cut off completely. And uh, it's, but it, it is swelling, swelling shut. And so it's not, it's reducing their tidal volume and not allowing enough um, oxygen to get to, down to the cells. So maybe they're some level of alert, but not adequately breathing. So we may need to intervene with them as well. Um, now, people may have adequate signs of breathing. Maybe the work of breathing is good, um, but some of their signs or symptoms um, may suggest respiratory distress. So we may, we may have to breathe for them too. Uh, everybody got to use the BVM the other day. So that's what I'm, that's what I'm talking about. We'll be breathing with our patients there. <clears throat> uh, when we're looking again at breathing, just we wanna listen here, we hear any sounds. Um, is the breathing adequate? Um, so let's think about what are the signs of inadequate breathing? Maybe they get pale, maybe they're hypoxic, maybe their skin is sweaty, maybe they're confused, they have slightly altered mental status. Right? Remember our guy, four of spades, four of spades. Um, maybe somebody can't follow directions well or, or things like that. So it all could be indications that they're not breathing well, they're not perfusing their cells well, not getting oxygen down there well. Um, and so uh, anything that suggests hypoxia, kind of, kind of keep, a, keep an eye out for. 
Um, <clears throat> circulation, uh, uh, one more thing on breathing. Um, if we find any issues here, not only can we use the PPV, but we can also give supplementary oxygen as well. This is where we're going to give oxygen uh, here. We're going to make a decision early to give oxygen with one, uh, usually it's gonna be one of our two uh, uh, delivery devices, either the nasal cannula or the nonverbal breather. So if they're really struggling to breathe, if they're, um, if they're getting down towards moderate hypoxia, then we can put that nasal, or excuse me, the um, nonverbal breather on them with high flow oxygen, 12 to 15 liters, we can put it on right now. Um, or the, put a nasal cannula on them either. So in breathing, we're gonna look how their breathing is working and how much oxygen they're kind of getting on board there. So this would be a good place to put the pulse oximeter on your patient uh, there to kind of figure that out. Because this is where we're making the decision about oxygen in breathing. Now we're gonna look at circulation. <clears throat> uh, first thing that we're gonna do when assessing uh, circulation, we're gonna assess the patient's skin condition. Um, the skin, as we've talked about, is a marvelous uh, sign for us. It's, a, it's like a giant billboard, basically, and it gives us a ton of information uh, there. So uh, if somebody has a healthy looking skin condition, right, whatever their color might be, it looks full, their skin looks healthy um, there, that's a sign that, they're, that they have good circulation. The body's not taking that blood and put and shunting it towards vital organs or anything else, right? We know that if somebody's bleeding or if they're um, getting some really hypoxic, we know that the body does that, right? Doesn't the blood doesn't need to be out the skin uh, for those situations? It needs to be uh, going to the brain and the heart, the lungs and the kidneys, right? So, but if it's going to the skin, they've got a nice, healthy skin color, right? Whatever their skin color is, it, it's nice and healthy looking. Um, it's uh, once you start looking for people, looking at their skin, noticing it, you'll, it's very easy to see healthy looking skin. And um, when you see somebody that's sick, it's, it's much easier once we start taking notice of that. So when you guys are out and about, if you're working or if you're going anywhere out in public at this point, um, keep an eye out for people's uh, skin conditions. Start looking at the condition of their skin. Does it look healthy? And if it doesn't, why? Ask yourself, why doesn't it look healthy to you? Um, is it the uh, color as, as far as like the pallor? Is it, is it pale? Is any of the color just like washed out? Um, is it really sweaty? Uh, is it bleeding? Um, does it have hives on it? Uh, things like that. Right? So um, we're going to, when we have good circulation, we're going to have warm, healthy looking dry skin. Right? It should be warm and it should be dry and it obviously should be healthy looking uh, there. Um, if we see somebody that's pale, clammy, uh, so pale, cool, and moist uh, skin, that's a sign that somebody could be in shock. And so pale, cool, and clammy. Um, we're going to learn about, we're going to hear that phrase about a hundred different times. Um, so pale, cool, and clammy, that is um, something we're going to get real familiar with and recognizing shock. And like I said, we just look at somebody's skin condition and we can get this information out of it. So hopefully it's warm, it's healthy looking, and it's dry. We're also going to check the pulse um, when we're checking uh, circulation. And we uh, there are basically three results we're looking for uh, when we check the pulse. Um, and let me specify here, we're not counting the pulse. We're not taking their heart rate right now. We're just going to feel it for about 10 seconds. That's it. Right? This, is, this is a quick kind of down and dirty when we're assessing airway, assessing breathing, assessing circulation. We're going to do the, as quickly as possible there and gather, but gather as much information as possible. So right now, when we're checking this pulse. It's, it's only for about 10 seconds, 10 seconds. And we're looking for three different things. Um, is it within normal limits, right? And that, by that, I mean the rate. Is it too fast? Is it too slow? Does it seem okay? Uh, we need to take care of that or, or pay attention to that. Does it feel strong or does it feel weak? And so is it too fast, too slow? Is it nice and strong or, is it, or does it happen to be weak or thready, it's called? Or is it regular and irregular? So hopefully our finding is that it's, um, it's not too fast, not too slow, strong and regular. So within normal limits, strong and regular. That's what we're looking for. But we've got to pay attention for those other things too. Right? So 
uh, here again the pulse we're not counting it we'll do that later um, right now we're just assessing the pulse to figure out things like how their circulation is going right how their heart is working uh, is the body compensating for anything these results here will tell us these kind of things so is it too fast too slow strong or weak regular or irregular and the last thing we're looking for in circulation is bleeding. I mean, well, the last thing that we're going to cover here, um, uh, we're not going to go through other things if we see severe bleeding and then, wait, and then take care of the bleeding. Um, so one of the things we'll check in circulation, um, it's probably going to be first if we notice it first, though, is severe bleeding, um, any exsanguinating bleeding, any bleeding that will cause the loss of life, um, real severe stuff. Um, real dangerous, life-threatening stuff. So we're going to be checking for that. Um, and if we see it, we're going to attempt to stop it, right? So we can either do uh, pressure bandages, and uh, should that fail, we'll move to our tourniquets uh, there. And we also have other options, um, which we'll talk about uh, when we get there. But so we're going to check for and control severe bleeding, right? So uh, back to the beginning of circulation here. We're going to assess the skin. We want it to be warm healthy looking and dry. Bad skin signs are it's pale, it's cool, it's clammy, really sweaty, and diaphoretic, right? So diaphoretic means sweaty, as we know. So um, they're going to be pale, cool, and diaphoretic if they're in shock. So um, we're going to get used to that. So we're going to, for circulation, we're checking their skin, and we can kind of be checking this out when we're doing our general impression, right? It's the first time we notice their skin condition. Um, so we're kind of doing some things there all at once. But so we're looking for our uh, our skin condition. We're checking our pulse. Is it within, not too fast, not too slow? Is it strong? Is it weak? Is it regular or is it irregular? And then we're checking for bleeding. And obviously, again, like I said, if we notice the light, uh, life-threatening bleeding, I don't have to sit there and check their pulse before I go in and control the bleeding. I can just control the bleeding and then come back to assessing the pulse and the skin condition. All right, after our ABCs, after we've assessed the airway, breathing and circulation and intervened, should we need to have uh, intervened, we're gonna determine the priority of the patient. How fast do we need to transport this patient to the hospital? Can we stay on scene and do things like take vital signs, talk about their medical history and what's been going on recently or today, whatever it may have been? Right, so that's that's calling like the what the old saying in EMS is: Do we have time to stay and play, or uh, has all of our information that we've gathered so far, when doing our general impression, the chief complaint, the, doing our ABCs, um, does that tell us that we need to load and go? Right? Can we stay and play, or can we load and go? Do you walk into that room and and you're like, oh my gosh, you should have been in the hospital yesterday, lady. Right? And you get there, you load her up in the ambulance as quickly as possible, and then you do the vast majority of your assessments en route to the hospital. Right? Um, so in, in gathering our general impression and our chief complaint, right? like, oh man, you look terrible, and then the patient says, ah, I think I'm, I'm having a heart attack. Well, just those two things, seeing that the patient looks really sick and their chief complaint right there should tell you that your priority should be very high. Right? Um, some other things that can help determine priority is like level of pain. Uh, is the uh, what area has been injured? Is it is it um, is it a life threatening area? Right? Do we have a head injury? Something like that? Um, is there exsanguinating bleeding? Is there uh, you know is the airway going to shut? Things like that. All right. If they have any threat to the ABCs, if there's any life threat, they're a high priority patient. Period. If there's any threat either right now or later, um, then they're a, a high priority. Um, if their vital signs are off, right? If they're out of the normie, uh, normie, out of the normal range, if they're abnormal and out of the normal range, um, and we talked about the normal ranges, uh, they're, if they're outside of that, then they're, then they're not stable. And if your patient is unstable, they are a high priority patient. So if you go to somebody's house and they're uh, for like a terrible migraine headache and you happen to notice that their blood pressure is like 186 over 110, like that is 
a incredibly high blood pressure. And maybe that points, that and the headache points to maybe a stroke or something like that. But just because it's so high in the abnormal, that makes that patient more of a high priority. Uh, as we said, any threat, whether it's right now or it's imminent, it's coming down the road in five minutes or 10 minutes, maybe 15 minutes, whatever it might be, um, uh, any threat to the ABCs uh, automatically makes that patient a high priority, even if you have solved it on scene, right? If somebody is uh, bleeding severely, like let's go back to our chainsaw guy. If he's got that, excuse me, if he's cut that uh, femoral artery and he's bleeding and you got there and you stopped it, you got the tourniquet on, you're a pro, you saved his life, it was awesome. Um, that does not mean that he is no longer a high priority. A person may still be a high priority, right? There was a life threat to the ABCs. We solved it for the moment. He's still a high priority, still got to get him to the hospital, okay? So whether that threat is real or it's coming, uh, whether it's right now or it's coming, they're, they're going to be a, a high priority. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, so there are a lot of times when it's not abundantly clear what's wrong with the patient and it takes some detective work um, and you may not be sure, you know, what's going on. It is okay and it is actually preferred that you err on the side of caution when you determine your priority. Make them a higher priority than, than maybe they actually are. Like, you know, we should move. I don't know what's going on here. This could be something serious. Let's go, let's not waste any time. Let's just go, let's just go. And it's okay if you're wrong that way. Like if you over uh, think their problems and think that it's worse than it is, it's okay to think that way. It's not okay to think like, ah, oh, they'll be okay. And then all of a sudden it gets worse, right? We don't have the right to be surprised. We just don't. Um, it, these are people's lives on the line and we can't be complacent. So um, you'd much rather err on the side of caution and making them a higher priority uh, than they actually might be, than making them a lower priority than what they are. Um, so if you're not sure what's going on, if it could be something in your mind that's dangerous, then make them a higher priority and, and get them to definitive care uh, there. Again, you don't want to make, make the mistake the wrong way there. Um, a patient's priority can absolutely change. Maybe they're a lower priority, right? When, um, when you get there and things get worse. And so they're a higher priority, but you know, maybe you're mid transport, maybe you're halfway to the hospital, things got worse. Now you gotta, your driver's really gotta hit the gas and turn the lights and sirens on, right? Um, so the priority can change. And so it's, uh, it's that vigilance, like keeping up with the airway, knowing the airway might change or their breathing might change, or maybe there's circulation problems that might change. Like the priority can change too, right? For better or worse. Um, uh, you know, uh, so just be vigilant. Things, most things are not static, right? They're not the same from the beginning to the end of the call, like our, our safety, right? Scene safety, our personal safety, that's a constant thing that we have to be, be vigilant for throughout the call, just like a patient's airway, just like their breathing and their circulation for us. The priority is a, something that we constantly reevaluate. Um, and so it can change for better or for worse, but just realize it can change. <clears throat> um, so if you get on scene and you have a poor general impression, a bad chief complaint, any threats to the ABCs, then we need to hit the road pronto, right? Like hit the road, Jack, like let's get going. Um, we need to initiate lights and sirens, um, uh, getting to the hospital quickly. Now there's lots of different codes and things like that. Um, back where I came from, where I came up, um, we would be uh, priority one patient would be the highest priority. These are the people that need help right now. There's a life threat in the next like 10 minutes or it's happening now or it could happen in like the next 10 minutes. Priority two, like their lives were in danger, but not immediately. Like if they didn't get to the hospital tonight, uh, or, you know, in the next couple hours, then maybe there's something really happening there. So there, there's problems, but it's not an immediate life threat. And then priority three is your normal transport. Um, you know, you can 
you're not moving with great urgency through priority three patients. Um, so that's a way that it has been there. So high priority, low priority. Um, code three in some places is writing lights and sirens. Um, and like I said, where I came up uh, from is priority one. You're writing lights and sirens. There's a life threat to this patient that needs to be handled immediately. They're unstable. Um, priority two, maybe they're a bit unstable, but there's no immediate life threat uh, at the moment. And then priority three, again, just normal kind of uh, transport. You're not rushing uh, things at all. <clears throat> um, yeah, and so if we have a high priority patient, we're gonna get them in the ambulance as soon as possible, and then we'll continue our assessments en route to the hospital. We don't have to stay at a patient's house and do all our work there. We can do stuff in the back of the ambulance. And um, to save time and to get these patients to definitive help, we will often do that. All right, so let's think about this. Um, why uh, do we have to continually reevaluate the primary assessment? You're gonna see on your sheet uh, there towards the bottom, uh, I think it's, the, I don't have one in front of me, but I think it's one of the last like three or four lines there uh, that says um, uh, reevaluates primary assessment. Why do you think that we have to reevaluate it? What are some of the things that may change about our primary assessment. Of the things that we're, that we're looking at and assessing there and, and gathering, what could change? Um, what do you think? Can your general impression change? Not really, because that's the kind of the first impression that you have um, of them and that gives you an idea. Now, later on, your assessment can reveal things where you're like, okay, uh, I need to be more quick about our treatment. We need to be more urgent about our treatment, or maybe we don't need to be. Um, and so, but it doesn't really change your general impression. That was your, it's your first uh, impression that you had of the patient. Um, what about the chief complaint? Yeah, that's probably not going to change. That's probably not going to change. A, Bs, and Cs, can those change? 100%. Absolutely. Absolutely, they can. And then your priority, can that change? As we just said, yeah, it definitely can. It definitely can. So um, we need to uh, be vigilant. And throughout the call, you're going to be keeping in mind, is that airway open? Will it stay open? Are they breathing? Is it adequate? And what their circulation is like, constantly look, reevaluating their skin uh, condition, um, checking their pulses. You know, obviously, hopefully, bleeding just doesn't spurt and start happening. Uh, in your call and you know while you're there in your care just uh, spontaneous bleeding or something like that but um, so we're going to be uh, reevaluating these things uh, constantly throughout the call we have to be aware of them all right all right so that's our ABCs all right um, and I'd like uh, for you guys to um, pay close attention uh, uh, to this um, and what we'll have soon here is a video for um, going through our medical assessment sheets. I'm gonna set that up for you guys so you can practice um, with each other and at home for going through that second box on our um, medical assessment of the patient. We should be practicing our scene size up, right? BSI, is the scene safe? Yes, it is. Nature of illness is trouble breathing. I have one patient, I'm gonna go ahead and call for ALS and I don't need to save c -SPAN right? Or something like that. So now we're going to add in on top of that, um, our primary assessment, and there'll be a short video to follow um, with that there to explain to you exactly how your dialogue should go throughout that. Um, all right, so that's the end of our chapter here. Um, uh, go ahead and rewind, rewatch, take your notes uh, as you need to. Uh, fire off some emails to me if you have any questions about anything that's been covered. Um, all right, great. And uh, we will uh, see you guys uh, very soon. Thanks.